Hi everyone, my name is Levi Kozan. Welcome to this YouTube channel. Today I am delighted to speak again with Anthony Lewis. We are continuing our conversation about primary directions. Hi Anthony, how are you today? Okay, good morning. Well, these are the questions. Uh, so this is our third discussion of primary directions. and I was hoping today to look at a couple more charts, but first review some of the concepts. And we want to keep this to about an hour, so I may go a little rapidly, but the, uh, the slides will be here that people can refer to, and if need be, can listen again, because it's not always obvious on the first uh, exposure. Uh, but we begin by talking about the rotation of the Earth, and as we all know, the ro Earth rotates on its axis from west to east, so that the sky appears to rise in the east and set in the west. And this is called the primary motion of the Earth or of the heavens, because the heavens appear to rise in the east, culminate at the midheaven, and set in the west as the earth rotates once a day on its axis. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about primary motion, this is what we're re referring to. And as the planets or points of the chart are carried by the rotation of the earth to the locations of other planets or points in the natal chart, those are called the primary directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a more complicated image of the same thing. We work with three main circles. The horizon, which is, uh, depends on where we are on Earth. It's our personal horizon. The ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, and all the planets travel fairly close to the ecliptic. And then the equator, which is the main measuring device we use for time, because it's in the center of the Earth and has a uniform motion. So if we know how far we've moved along the equator, we know how many minutes or hours we've been traveling. Where would you draw the prime vertical here? Maybe it's good for... Yeah, it's actually, it is here. It's a circle that goes uh, through the top of the head. This is the person that's the top of his head through his zenith. Down here directly below his feet would be his nadir to... Uh, mm -hmm. If he were facing south to his left would be due east, which is here, and to his right would be due west. So it's a circle that goes through the top of your head, the bottom of your feet, due east and west. It's a circle that you stand in as you face due south. And so that line is going to be very important in how planets rise along the eastern point there. Again, daily motion. I found this slide on a site called Slide Player. Here's the reference. Uh, again, to point out, as the Earth rotates from west to east, the sky appears to rotate from east to west, and we call that the primary motion of the heavens. Okay? Uh -huh. At the equator, everything rises and sets at 90 degrees to the horizon. Uh, again, this is by way of review because we've covered this in previous discussions. Yes. So the Earth rotates west to east, the primary motion and gives rise to primary directions because the sky appears to rotate from east to west. And as points in the sky match up to where points are in the natal chart, we say a primary direction occurs. Mm -hmm. And Ptolemy made the assumption or equation that each degree of motion along the equator sh should be symbolically equivalent to one year in the life of the person. And I'll talk a little more about that. I'm not 100% clear why he did that, but I, I have a theory about his reasoning. Mm -hmm. And there may be some experts who really know why he thought it. Um, I think it helps. This is an analogy. If you consider your natal chart a map, a kind of fixed map, and this car is driving along the map, so the car is one of your natal points being carried by primary motion as the Earth turns on mm -hmm. its axis. Then let's, let's just say this blue pin is the ascendant, this is the midheaven, this yellow pin is maybe the sun in your chart. Mm -hmm. Well, whatever this car is, maybe it's Mars, and maybe at birth Mars is right near the ascendant. But as the Earth turns after birth, the sky will carry the position of Mars up toward the midheaven, and at some point the position of Mars will correspond to the position of the sun in the birth chart. Mm -hmm. 
And the, the reference scheme here is always the the MC and the ascendant. The horizon and the midheaven give you a frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So when Mars gets carried by the rotation of the Earth to the same point the sun was at in your birth chart, we say that Mars conjoins the sun by primary direction. Mm -hmm. And we could time that because we'd find out how long it took uh, the sky to move across the midheaven. Say it took an hour, and every four minutes is a year. So at age 15, you'd have a Mars-Sun conjunction by primary direction, and maybe you'd uh, win some sporting event. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think this is a good analogy because the map is fixed at your birth chart. It doesn't move. And the, the points or parts of your chart that don't move are called the significators. Mm -hmm. And the parts that are in your imagination carried by the rotation of the earth to these fixed points uh, are called the promisors. Mm -hmm. So Mars in this chart promises something when he reaches the sun, which is fixed. And Mars gets carried that by the there by the rotation of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So the map is the significator, and the moving planet or point is the promisor. So this is a really good analogy to keep in mind. Uh, we talked about converse primary directions. Going back here, converse simply means it's also possible to imagine that what normally would be the promisor, the car here could be kept st still and you could move the map beneath it yes in that case since the primary motion is always in this direction from the ascendant toward the midheaven the ascendant would appear to move up and join the car at some point in your life mm -hmm. that would be called the converse direction because you're taking the map and moving it under the car which is sort of the converse of the normal way you think about things okay so the direct direction would be car going to the sun. The converse would be a point down here like the ascendant. Uh, as you turn the whole map and keep the car still moving up and conjoining the car. What would be the difference? Astrologers observe that if you're studying, say, the planet Mars here, my red car, something usually occurs in the life when Mars gets carried to the sun by primary motion. It's going in this direction, right? It's going up. But sometimes something occurs of the nature of Mars joining the ascendant. Well, if Mars can only go in this direction up, how is it going to join the ascendant, which is behind it? And the way, mathematical way around that is to say, well, let's imagine for a minute we can hold Mars still and just move the ascendant up toward Mars. Normally, the ascendant is fixed. It stays still. But we're going to say, let's move the map, the fixed map, toward the car instead of letting the car drive across the fixed map. Mm -hmm. So here the ascendant moves to Mars and we'd say that's a converse Mars conjoins the ascendant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's really a matter of semantics, but the, the point is directions can occur in either primary directions can occur with the points of either ahead of the car or behind the car. Sure. So maybe when the ascendant gets to the car, your parents buy you a new car, your teenager. Mm -hmm. and you, then you take your car, you hit the sun, have an accident. <laughs> Directing through the bounds. This is a busy slide. I'll just explain it. Um, the idea here is that after birth, the whole chart is appearing, appearing to rotate like a clock. So that all the points below the ascendant slowly rise toward the ascendant. And each sign is divided into five what we call terms or bounds. Mm -hmm. So that at certain points of life, certain planets will be governing the bounds or the terms of the signs on the ascendant. And those planets will become very important time lords or the Dasha lords in the Vedic system. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to read this. I'll leave, people can read it on their own because we want to get through everything in an hour. Sure. Uh, Curtis Manwaring has a nice site. He, he wrote the um, Delphic Oracle so software. 
And he has some very good explanations of how the math is done. And again, I'm not going to belabor it. People can read it. But he says there's no question about how to direct to the ascendant or midheaven because they're, they're fixed points on the ecliptic and you can just let planets rise till they conjoin the horizon or the midheaven and you know where they are. The mm -hmm. problem occurs what happens with two points in between, like the car and the sun were not the, the ascendant or midheaven. And there's different ways of deciding when the car will actually reach the sun. It's a coordinate system. You know, it's like the discussion you and I had about planetary war in Vedic astrology. Yeah. On the ecliptic, yes. two planets may be very close in the uh -huh. same degree. Yes. But if you look at them in the prime vertical, they may be several degrees apart. Yes. So it's really the frame of reference. They right. may look like they're in planetary war on the ecliptic, but on the prime vertical, they may be quite spread apart and not be conflicting at all. The issue really is, how do you do the math? Planets are in three-dimensional space. So say that the sun is here and Mars is here, they look quite far apart. But if I'm measuring, say, let's do it this way, along a vertical line, they look like they're conjunct on my vertical line. Mm -hmm. So when they're aligned on the vertical line, do we say that's when the primary direction is perfect? Or yeah. say they're in this direction, maybe there is a skewed line that goes through both of them. Well, maybe that's when they can join. Because we're trying to measure three-dimensional space with a two-dimensional plane. The one that works best in practice, giving the most concrete result, or most accurate result, rather. The two most common forms are the Ptolemaic semi-arc, proportional semi-arc, and then in the Middle Ages, Renaissance period, Regiomontanus directions were the rage, and people use them with good results, and they often have give results that are a year or two apart. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the mysteries of astrology. Like, the technique you're using tends to work in the period or for the astrologer who's using it, but not for somebody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's one of the crazy things about astrology. Here's one of the examples I wanted to go to. Uh, Donald Trump won the 2016 election in the United States. Uh, which very few people expected, uh, including most astrologers thought he would not. Mm -hmm. But if we look at his primary directions, and I use to calculate this, I use a site, it's in Spanish, but it's pretty easy to use, called carta-natal.es for Spain, España. And it will calculate, if you put in a natal chart and a date in history, it will calculate the primary directions for that date using what's called the Nibod rate, which I'll discuss later. Ptolemy said each degree moving past the midheaven is a year of life. Astrologers began to notice that Ptolemy's rate, one degree for a year of life, tended to pinpoint events be much before they occurred, months, sometimes months before they occurred. So Nibod reasoned that we have to correct Ptolemy's rate a little bit and he equated one rotation of the earth in sidereal time to a year of life. On this site, they calculated that on the date of the election, Trump's ascendant had moved to 24 degrees Libra, 50 minutes essentially. In the center is Trump's natal chart, and then on the outside are the directed positions. And so here, this red line here is the directed ascendant, and it had moved to 24 Libra. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is called directing through the bounds, this method, because what Dorotheus did is he looked at, and I'll show a chart in a minute, what planet was ruling the term in 24 degrees of Libra mm -hmm. in November of 2016. Uh, but before I get there, I just want to show you the site that I just mentioned, the Carta Natal site, it will list all the aspects in effect on that date. And this is the date of the U.S. elections. The, the closest aspect was Saturn, 24, 24 of Virgo, directed Saturn, exactly trying the natal midheaven. Let's go back. So the ascendant had moved to here, but Saturn had moved to 
24 Virgo, and the natal midheaven is exactly 24 Virgo. So there was an exact trine of Saturn to the midheaven, mm -hmm. which corresponded with his winning the election. This is a chart from Curtis Manwaring's program. Here's Trump's natal chart. This is where the ascendant mm -hmm. had progressed, or this point actually had progressed up to the horizon, mm -hmm. 24 of um, Libra. Libra. And it's in the term of Venus here. So Venus is a time lord for this period. Uh, you can see it over, he lists them here. We're in Libra, and in 2016, we're in the bounds or terms of Libra. And just before that, the election, we had a, a square from Venus. Uh, Venus here is 25, it squares down here at 25. Mm -hmm. If you take into the account the latitude of Venus, the square actually occurs before the election. So he has a nice aspect from Venus, uh, aspecting the bounds of Venus, which is the, the ascendant at the time, the directed ascendant at the time of the election. And Venus happens to rule his, the tenth sign from the ascendant. Yes. Mm -hmm. It has a significance in whole signs of his career. Okay. Sure. Uh, this is what his birth chart looks like in the sky. I think it's always helpful to look at these kinds of maps. Mm -hmm. The blue line is the equator. The green line is the prime vertical. So somebody standing here, their, Z, their zenith would be here, nadir would be down here, east point over here, west point over mm -hmm. here. They'd be facing south. The ecliptic would be here. Uh, and so when he's born, the star Regulus, which is a royal star of kings, had mm -hmm. just risen, and so had Mars. So this is a kind of a royal birth of a Mars-like person. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right. Uh, this, I put this here just to show the idea of the ascensional times, each sign of the zodiac has a different length of time it takes to rise. Uh -huh. And these are measured in the number of degrees that pass the midheaven while the sign is rising. So Aries, for instance, takes about 18 degrees crossing the midheaven to rise. Uh -huh. Trump has the end of Leo rising. So basically, during the first period of his life, Virgo is rising. That takes about 38 degrees on the midheaven, or 38 years. And that's followed by Libra, which also takes about 38 degrees or 38 years. These are called signs of long ascension, because they take a long time to rise. So he won the election at age 70, so he's in this Libra period. And we saw that prior to that, he was in the Venus bound or term of this Libra period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Libra really governs this whole second part of his life, and when he's in the Venus bound of Libra, that's highly significant because it also rules the sign, mm -hmm. and it's receiving a aspect from Venus as well. And right. Venus rules his tenth, mm -hmm. tenth yes. uh, whole sign. So you would expect a major career event during this Venus. And a square would be a, a manifesting aspect. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And as a, if we, and that's the square is from the zodiacal degree of Venus, mm -hmm. but Venus has a latitude. So if we measure the square from the latitude, it actually is about 24 degrees instead of 25. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly on, almost exactly on the directed ascendant. So Venus is highly, highly uh, activated during this period mm -hmm. at age 70. This is just saying the same thing in table form. These are the districts with latitude. So I included the latitude of the planet. And you can see here, November of 2016 falls in this period. He's in the Venus bound and had just received the square from Venus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, go, he went to his Mars bound in 2019 
And I think that has characterized his presidency a lot. He's fighting with a lot of people. <laughs> it's a very Martian period he's going through. Um, this is his chart again, I think showing a little more clearly the bounds. Here's the bound he's in at age 70. He's right here. Venus has squared it. And this is his ascendant is right here. Uh, he also happens to be in the decan of Jupiter. The Greeks also used individual degrees. Each individual degree is associated with a planet. And the planet ruling his directed ascendant at the time of the election was Saturn. So Saturn becomes very important during that year. This is just to remind me to mention we're using the sexagesimal space 60 system, which is very helpful in astrology. The math. The zodiac we're using is a mathematical model. It's not the constellations. And this is to talk to the issue of single degrees. So the circle consists of 360 degrees. And each degree of the circle is considered an individual part. Just as the signs or boundaries in the zodiac, the individual degrees are kind of the smallest regions that have boundaries that are assigned to planets in the Hellenistic system. Mm -hmm. And so there was a method of assigning planets to the degrees. Uh, there were a couple of methods, but the more popular one was, I think, used by Vedius Valens and Paulus of Alexandria. And what they did is they used the, the Chaldean order of planets, and they divided each sign into 30 parts, so let's say zero to 30. And the first part belonged to the planet ruling the sign. So if this were Aries, zero to 30, mm -hmm. then the first degree would belong to Mars. The second degree would be the next planet in order from Mars in Chaldean order of you know, descending speeds, basically. So after mm -hmm. Mars comes the sun, the third degree after the sun would be Venus, the fourth degree after Venus would be Mercury, after Mercury would be the moon, that would be the fifth degree, I think. Then Saturn and Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And you would continue that sequence for the remainder of the sign. Mm -hmm. And that will give you the planet by degree that's most important. And 24 degrees of Libra, which was his directed ascendant, happens to fall in a Saturn degree. So you'd want to study Saturn in the directed chart, and Saturn is exactly trying his natal midheaven, which I thought was significant. And also, wasn't Saturn also conjuncting Venus there? Or? I think it was, yeah. So I think this had a lot to do with why Ptolemy equated a single degree with a year of life, because a single degree was the smallest whole part of a, of a circle. Uh, and we hmm. tend to divide our lives into individual years so the mm -hmm. reason is by analogy a, a whole part of a circle which is a degree corresponds to a whole part of the life which is a year right the smallest division of the zodiac here's a table of the single degrees called mono moria i put this table together in excel but basically the ruler of the sign always rules the first degree and since there's seven planets it rules the first eighth fifteenth 22nd, 29th, going every seven planets. So here, let's take a person whose ascendant is in the 18th degree of Cancer. So 17 to 18 of Cancer. Here's 17th degree. We go over to Cancer's ruled by the Moon. That degree is ruled by Mars. So this person with Cancer rising should have Mars characteristics. This would be kind of a lunar Cancery person mm -hmm. with a strong tint of Mars. Let's do Trump. This is the 25th degree of Libra. Libra is ruled by Venus, so Saturn rules that degree. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So that's when he won the election. The following year, Jupiter becomes the ruler because it moves about a degree a year, so he starts the presidency under a Jupiter influence. This is a quote from Ptolemy. Uh, this is from the Loeb edition of Ptolemy, and he says, how many equinoctial periods, meaning single degrees on the equator, those are equinoctial periods. Each one of these equinoctial periods has a value of a solar year, according to Loeb edition. So each degree on the equator is a year of life. I'm not going to talk about sidereal time. What Naibod did is he took a rotation of the Earth. 
Naibod argued that Ptolemy's method, in effect, seemed to equate one degree on the equator with the ancient Egyptian year of 360 degrees. What the Egyptians did, they had a calendar in which the, each day of the year was a degree. So there were 360 days in the year. And then there was an, what they called an intercalary period of about five and a half days, five uh -huh. and a quarter days, which they used to do religious rituals, propitiate the gods and so on, before uh -huh. starting the new year after this like five-day intercalary period. So Naibon and astrologers at this time were noticing that the Ptolemy rate was coming up, timing things too early. And so Naibon said, we have to fix this. Here's my reasoning. Let's take the 360 degrees in a circle and divide it by the number of days in a year, 365.24, mm -hmm. and that gives me 0.9854, etc. cetera, uh, degrees per rotation of the Earth, basically, mm -hmm. which is 59 minutes, 8.33 seconds. Mm -hmm. So let's let that rate be one year of life. So not yes. every one minute, one, one degree on the equator is a year of life, but every 59 minutes and 8.33 seconds is a year of life. And by shortening the amount of time that crosses the equator, you're projecting the events for, more forward into the future. Because right? you're dividing by a smaller number when you do it. Mm -hmm. And basically, it turns out when you do the math, roughly every 3.93 minutes, let's say 3.932 minutes of time corresponds to a year of life, as opposed to every four minutes corresponding to a year of life. Four minutes would be the Ptolemy rate, closer to the Ptolemy rate. 3.932 is more than Naibod rate. It's very little difference in time, but if you project it over the lifetime, it really change the dates of things by months. Ptolemy's idea of primary directions, this is the semi-arc method. This is a direct quote from the Loeb edition. A place is similar and the same. So when are two planets in the same place? That's the question he's answering. A place is similar and the same if it has the same position in the same direction with reference to the horizon and meridian. So what he's saying here is our reference system is always the local meridian and horizon. They're sort of an X, Y axis. Uh -huh. And so when the image we saw before, we saw the sun was maybe up in the 11th house near the midheaven. That was the yellow tack. And uh -huh. the car was maybe halfway up between the ascendant and midheaven. Uh -huh. When the car gets to the same position with reference to the horizon, the meridian, we'll say it conjoins the sun. That's Ptolemy's method. And this is the method that was popularized by Placidus. Reggio Montanus had a different method. This is an image. Uh, I don't know the source of this. I found this years ago, many years ago on the internet, and I neglected to write down the source. If somebody knows, I wish they'd tell me. But this is a good example. Uh, this blue line here uh, is the path of Jupiter. And it's about midway between the ascendant and the midheaven. Mm -hmm. Jupiter is below the ecliptic here. And so this is the path of the sun. So wh how can we know when Jupiter gets to the sun? Well, we'd say that by T Ptolemy's method, the sun is at a certain proportion of its path from yes. the ascendant up to the midheaven. When Jupiter gets proportionately at the same point, here it's three-fifths of its path. We'll say they're conjunct. So let me repeat that. The sun at birth was three-fifths of the way between the ascendant and the midheaven. Mm -hmm. It's rising toward the midheaven. Jupiter is about halfway. How do we know when Jupiter conjoins the sun by primary direction? Ptolemy said, well, when Jupiter gets three-fifths of the way along its path, it's in a corresponding position to where the sun is at birth, three-fifths of the way along its path, 
and we will call that a conjunction. And that's this proportional semi-arc method. Bruce Lee. I think people know who Bruce Lee is. He's a martial artist who died suddenly. This is his birth chart. He was born in San Francisco, November 1940 in the morning. This is in the tropical zodiac. He had six of Sag rising. So if we look here, this is the meridian at his birthplace. The blue line is the equator and the yellow line is the ecliptic. And so he's born at seven in the morning. You can see the sun is just rising, about to rise. Mm -hmm. And he has these planets that have risen uh, toward his midheaven, which is right here. His moon and Mercury are in the 11th house. Okay, This is Bruce Lee again, born around sunrise. Here's the ecliptic. Uh, his ascendant, if we project it by a vertical line to the equator, we get the right ascension of the ascendant. That's his equatorial position. But the oblique ascension is the point on the equator that's rising at the same time as the ascendant is. So we have to go along here to where the horizon hits the equator. Mm -hmm. And that's the oblique ascension. We measure directions to the midheaven by the right ascension on the equator. Yeah. and directions to the ascendant by the oblique ascension. When will they be at the same point on the horizon? We call this difference the ascensional difference. Sometimes you see that in equations. If you people who want to get into the equations how to calculate this, the sign of the ascensional difference is the tangent of the geographic latitude of the person times the tangent of the declination. And if you know this formula, you can calculate these values. It's a very useful formula. So this was Bruce Lee's birth chart in a standard round form. I'm using the tropical zodiac. Mm -hmm. His moon is at 11 Scorpio. It rules his eighth cusp, which has to do with his longevity his, and death. Mm -hmm. uh, and it conjoins Mars at four degrees and it is opposite Saturn. Okay. The reason I'm focusing on Mars and Saturn is I'm going to look at the primary directions for when he died. Yes. And so for that, I'm going to look at malefics that affect the moon. Mm -hmm. Because the moon is the eighth house ruler. And Saturn and Mars often have to do with death. Well, you would also look at his ascendant, right? His ascendant rules. And the ascendant, yeah. Saturn also happens to be in the sixth hole sign, and Mars rules the um, and occupies the twelfth hole sign. Yes, and Jupiter and the moon, is there as well. The eighth sign. So you'd think that mm -hmm. an aspect involving Moon, Mars, and Saturn connecting the sixth, eighth, and twelfth house yes. lords mm -hmm. would, would be kind of ominous in his life. The ascendant, as you pointed out, is at six of Sag, and it is in ecliptic about 24 degrees from the moon. Okay. So if we just mm -hmm. measured along the ecliptic from the ascendant to the moon, we'd get 24 degrees. Yes. If we measured from the ascendant up to the opposition of Saturn, Saturn's where, what do we say Saturn is? I don't think I wrote the degree of Saturn down. Well, it would be around the same point, right? Right. We get 26 degrees, a couple degrees later. Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm looking at that is I'm speculating that since the ascendant rules his vitality, his life force, his body, when the ascendant by prior directions hits this cluster, Moon, Mars, Saturn, mm -hmm. he's at risk of death. That's the point I'm making. Yes. Here's the same chart, it's a little more visible. So when the ascendant degree gets carried by primary direction up to this region, moon mars and opposite saturn it's at nine yeah uh, he's in trouble for these several years okay mm -hmm. uh, it's also interesting that from the vedic angle the second lord saturn and the seventh lord mercury, mercury yeah. are right. the two maracas and who are also involved right. with this with besides then all these dushtana places or bad places right so he's got this region is bad news for him because he's got yes. The lords of uh, 6, 8, and 12 here. He's got the two Marika planets here. Mm -hmm. And his ascendant is going to come up here. 
we measure 26 on the ecliptic so we we can because the ecliptic's angled with respect to the equator mm -hmm. it's going to be somewhere in his 20s or 30s we have to pinpoint it by doing the math yes uh, which is what we did here um i'm going to skip this slide this just gives coordinates here I wanted to make the point about how long do the signs take to rise. He has Sagittarius rising. If we look here, Sagittarius is a sign of long ascension. So mm -hmm. it's going to take a while for the ascendant to get up here because this sign takes a long time to rise. It takes about roughly 36, 35, 36 degrees on the uh, midheaven to rise and each degree is a year of life. Mm -hmm. Because this is rising slowly, it takes a long time to rise. Uh, the 26 degrees on the ecliptic is going to refer to a time much later in his life, like 30, 35, in that range. Well, here I actually did the math. <laughs> I used that formula I talked about before. Mm -hmm. For those who want to do the math, I'm not going to go through this. But I actually calculated, let me go back here. I calculated, since we're working with the ascendant, I calculated the oblique ascension of these planets and the oblique ascension of the ascendant to figure out how long it would take for the ascendant to move up here by primary direction. And so that's what this slide is. And without going laboriously through the math, but here it is, I, did, I got out my calculator and did this. Um, the oblique ascension, subtracting the oblique ascension of the moon from the ascendant gave me 31 plus something degrees. Mm -hmm. So I would expect him to die at about age 31 by Ptolemy's key. That's one degree. But right. by the Nibod key, it would give me about 31.79 years. So about age 32, there's a high risk of death. And he actually died at age 32.6. Primary directions are rarely accurate to the date, but they usually give you a range within maybe six months either side of the date. So here is that same site I used, the Carta Natal ES, to calculate the chart. Here I did it converse because I was moving the ascendant, which is normally fixed, up toward the planets, which mm -hmm. normally move. So I had to do the converse direction yes normally you move the planets toward the ascendant but here mm -hmm. if i move the planets they're moving away from the ascendant so i did the converse option and move the ascendant toward the planets mm -hmm. and so he died july 20th 1973 the directions are outside and the natal chart is inside and you can see that here is his directed ascendant it's moved, it's right on top of his Moon-Mars conjunction. Yes. Uh, you know, within a very small orb, and he died within months of the date this was exact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, it's a very volatile region there. I'm from looking yeah. at from all angles, actually. Right, but if you look at this ascendant, it's really activating Moon, Mars, uh, Saturn. Mercury and Opposed. Saturn yeah, and probably Jupiter. More. Yeah, sure. And Jupiter rules his ascendant as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he died right on time according to his primary directions. Yeah. And you know, we're assuming that the the time of the chart is seven twelve, I think. So it it's to and that's from the birth certificate. So it's possible he was born at seven eleven, seven thirteen, within that range. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possible if we adjusted uh, the birth time by a little bit, maybe half a minute, that this would turn to be 32.6. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is very possible for a person, especially in those days. Well, each degree is a year of life, so 31.8 to 32.6 is maybe three minutes of time on. So if his birth time were not exact, if we were three minutes off, then this direction would be exact. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, here, again, this is the same site. His directed 
ascendant had gone to 10 of Scorpio 17. Let's go back. And Saturn was at nine, I think of, um, so it's about a degree off. Oh, I have the natal positions. So his directed ascendant on the day he died was at 10 of Scorpio 17. Mm -hmm. That matches the natal moon was at 11, 23. So it's mm -hmm. about a degree off. Mercury's 15. That's pretty far off. Uh, Saturn is at 929. That's pretty close. That's 10, close. 14, 929. Mm -hmm. um, and the these are the closest aspects at the time of death. Yeah, Sun opposite Saturn. Actually, that's almost exact, isn't it? The directed Sun is at 916 and Saturn's yeah, at Saturn. 929. Yeah. So, and the sun is also a symbol of your vitality. Sure. And the ascendant is opposite, uh, but the closest is the sun opposite Saturn. Mm -hmm. And that's just what about 14, 13 degrees of arc, 13 degree minutes of arc difference. Let's go back to the chart. By converse direction, the sun, which is almost on his ascendant, who's born at nearly sunrise, has moved to, we said 916, and it opposes Saturn at 9.24. Yes, and Saturn is a marker. If we had adjusted the birth time slightly, the sun might have been exactly opposite Saturn. Mm -hmm. The directed sun might have been exactly opposite Saturn at the time of death. So you, you would consider this as a rectification tool? Uh, people use it for rectification. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little skeptical because most of the time, the directions are usually within months to not to the day. Yeah, exactly. I think the people who use it with directions tend to use it more to house cusps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that when a significant planet by direction comes to a natal house cusp, mm -hmm. uh, that's a much more precise measurement. I view it more as a Dasha system. This is a period when the sun opposite Saturn is prominent in his life. And since the sun spans about 34 minutes of arc in the sky, it's going to take about two minutes pass over the midheaven, the sun itself. Each degree is a year of life. So the body of the sun corresponds to about six months of life. Ptolemy's rule is each Degree crossing the midheaven is a year of life. And each degree takes about four minutes to cross the midheaven. Uh -huh. The body of the sun would sit on the midheaven for two full minutes. Yes. Which corresponds to a little over six months of life. So when the sun is opposing Saturn, that we're talking about a six-month period where that's an exact opposition. Yes. Because yes. uh -huh. the body of the sun is opposing the body of Saturn exactly for six months. And so he died within that six month period. Mm. Right. The body of the sun is actually opposite the body of Saturn at the moment he died. Because mm. the difference was 14 minutes of arc. 14 minutes of arc is a quarter of a degree. That's what, it, what I was saying, a quarter, three it's a quarter month, of a degree. It's a yes. three month period. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. right. sure, it's clear. But the sun is threatening death here for a six month yeah. period. Mm -hmm. So he died in the middle of it. I see the primary directions as covering a period of life. So you can progress any point, any important point, any planet, any cusp, any important line. The inner chart is a natal chart, and the outer chart is the converse direction. So we're just taking the natal chart and letting the whole thing rotate like a clock around the inner chart. So his ascendant has tick, 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 tick up here at age 32. It's moved up to here. Mm -hmm. But as it did that, the moon, which was here, has moved up to here. Mercury, which was here, has moved up to here. So it's actually very similar to a Varsha Pulse or to a solar return. And look at yeah. the little chart connected to these transiting points. So it's similar, yeah. It's similar, it's similar in thinking. Um, you can also look at combinations between these transiting points to the natal positions and then derive meaning from that, which works really well. Right, and the idea is the inner chart, the... Uh, the natal chart is the potential at birth, what could happen, what might happen, what is possible. Mm -hmm. The outer chart, as it ticks, trigger the natal potentials. 
So he had a natal potential to die at this time because of this confluence of six, eight, twelve rulers with the Amarakas, with uh, the ascendant ruler, all getting activated in this period. So in and fact, all these points, all these progress progressions are all part of the natal chart. That's what we're you're taking the natal chart and rotating around the outside of the wheel. Yeah. Right, because that's the same thing in Varshafal. We have the natal chart and then it's like it looks like a very static thing. It's this blueprint and yeah. right. But actually it's all the solar returns, all these points, all these transits are all part of that. It's all the natal chart, right? Right. But except these aren't transits, these are Directions. These are directions, but yeah. they serve the same purpose, I would say. It's a similar interpretive principle. See, the sun and the ascendant, these are points, they're promisers. They promise vitality and health and the state of the body. But when the things that promise the state of his body get to the significators of death in his chart, the state of his body meets up with the significators of death and he dies. Yeah, it's also the dispositor of the sun, which is always important, like the ruler of anything is important, mm -hmm. is also opposing that, right. and also connected to the moon, which is the eight, and so on, and opposing, of course. Um, yeah, so he has an amazing confluence of planets that indicate ill health and death that get triggered by the sun and the ascendant being directed to this part of his chart. Thank you, Anthony, for this extensive elaboration on planet directions <laughs> and giving us also the foundation of it. I think um, it's very interesting. And um, yeah, I think after these three videos, people will have a good um, basic understanding and then they can look some further if they're interested in exploring. Yeah. And I do recommend the interview Ashwin did with Martin Ganst. It's an excellent interview and it really explains a lot of the background theory as well. All right. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you and I'll talk to you soon.